All My right. <laughs> and I am a lecturer at the University of North Texas, um, and I am newly appointed the um, Director of Corporate Relations for the Department of Technical Communication. Awesome. That's a that's a big deal, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So what we're going to do, give you a little format. We're going to ask some questions, and then towards the end, we'll get to uh, the Q&A, and uh, I'll have our moderator uh, send me all the questions that everybody puts in. And then uh, we'll have you answer them and then get you out. Because, guys, uh, he was nice enough to come on during his family vacation. Uh, so I do, really do appreciate it, man. I really do. No um, problem. All right. So first question is, where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? Okay. Uh, I grew up in Argyle, Texas, uh, in Denton, Texas, where I live now. Um, and I also grew up going to South Carolina and North Carolina every summer, spending my summers with my grandparents at uh, Myrtle Beach. Uh, and my childhood was a happy one, privileged, um, to say the least. I got to travel a lot. Um, my parents were both musicians, um, so I got uh, exposed to a lot of culture, a lot of music. Um, that's about it. I love sports. I love baseball. I've watched a lot of baseball over the years. Um, have a happy childhood. So you have any siblings? I have two siblings, um, Grace Little and Nathan Little. Um, and I have several half siblings, uh, other than them. Um, and both of my parents are, were, uh, professional musicians and my father still is a professor of music at the university of North Texas actually. Awesome. So how how was that uh, having a a dad in in music and not only that but in uh, higher education and teaching music? Uh, it was interesting. Um, I got exposed to a lot of music. It was there was no pressure on me to do music, but I wanted to do music because that's what my parents did. Um, I went to a lot of concerts. I played the flute until high school. Um, I was in several rock bands in college and flute. Other uh, you played flute yeah, in rock bands. Flute. I didn't play the flute. No, I sang okay. uh, a few bands in college. Um, let's see. Um, but uh, having a father who was in uh, higher education, it really was um, the emphasis in my life was on academics and doing well in school, uh, which I did not really like. And I didn't really want to do well at the time when I was growing up. Hmm. So when did, you, when did you start writing? When did you get into writing? So I started writing... Um, when I was in elementary school, I believe, I, I kind of liked to write stories, make up stories. And then I got seriously into poetry when I kind of discovered, you know, literature um, in middle school and high school. And I, I wrote a lot of, you know, absurdist, crazy poetry and fiction and I eventually got a bachelor's degree in creative writing um, from the University of North Texas. Yeah. Um, how was that degree? How was going through that process? Well, I started actually at a university in North Carolina um, called Warren Wilson College, which is in Asheville or around Asheville. And it was a lot of intense um, creative uh, process, a lot of going through, uh, you know, plot and story and um, just coming up with whatever I wanted, which I really liked. I liked to control and I wasn't really... I, at the time, I wasn't really writing for other people. I was writing for myself, which I realized that you need an audience. You need to know your audience. And the audience is actually way more important than you, the writer. Um, but I didn't come to know that until a lot later uh, in life. Was there any stories that you remember creating that's, that still stick with you today that you were like, well, that was, that was kind of cool. I kind of want to. Mm, I don't know. I, I'm very critical. I, I don't like anything I've done. I'm one of those people. I, I wrote a lot of dystopian future short stories um, that I, I guess I really, you know, was inspired by a lot of culture and movies that I'd seen, um, a lot of uh, just whatever I was into at the time I was kind of writing about. And it was all, you know, mainly love stories, mainly um, weird future, you know, government destroying the culture and destroying society or whatever it was, some sort of mass exodus of people i don't know it was it was a lot of crazy stuff that i thought about when i was in high school and college uh 
but I don't think any of them are publishable or worthy of reading actually at this point. Um, any influencers that you can, that, that really made the most impact that you can name off? Yeah, I would say, um, I, I really enjoyed Haruki Murakami. Um, the no, Wind yeah. of Bird Chronicle was one of my favorite, mm-hmm. um, the novels and, uh, Raymond Carver, all of his short stories, what we talk about when we talk about love minimalists. Um, I like, uh, just Bukowski. I mean, I, I could go on, but I, I have a lot of, uh, different people that I, uh, like to look to for inspiration in my writing. Uh, in my creative writing, that's, that's just my creative writing. Um, Tolstoy. Um, awesome. Yeah. Um, so what, what happened after you got your bachelor's? So before I got my bachelor's, I moved to China and lived there and taught there and then came back to get my bachelor's uh, and finish it off at the University of North Texas. Um, after I got my bachelor's, I moved back to China and I lived in Shanghai for about a year and a half. Um, and I taught English to high schoolers um, and prepared them for uh, a common placement exam to uh, move to uh, uh, English speaking college. So hopefully when they would finish this exam and place high enough, they would be able to go to Australia or Canada or America or somewhere like that, or England. Um, so this was a pretty common test that all Chinese students who were seeking to go abroad would take. Um, but yeah, I spent some time there and then I came back to the States after that. How, how long did you, were you in, in China total? About four years, give or take oh, wow. a couple months. Um, I lived in three different areas. Uh, I lived in central China. I lived in North China. And then I lived kind of near uh, South China, near Shanghai. That's cool. And we met, we met in a, a place called uh, Harbin, China. That's right. That's right. That was That's... the second place I lived. Uh, and I met you. Uh, we obviously connected on a lot of levels, uh, love music. We both uh, lived together. We um, had a great time, played a lot of games, met a lot of people, hung out a lot. Worked. Yeah. We did a lot of work um, and we mostly worked on the, the weekends. We worked like 10 hour days or 11 hour days on the weekend. Um, I remember, and then on the weekdays, it was like two hours or three hours at night that we'd work and then we'd have Mondays off Right. It was, it was an excellent schedule for us. We had, we had fun. Yeah. That was a you were good pretty time. much my only friend at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was really thankful that you were there to share that. And also to kind of confirm some of the crazy stories that I have, um, that I'm not crazy, um, to <laughs> people here in the States. It, it was, it was such a surreal experience. Just the Russian influence, and then there was just like this really mishmash of cultures where we were. It was bizarre living in North China. It was uh, very strange. Uh, a lot of people from Vladivostok came down on their vacations. I believe uh, they thought we were Russian. Sometimes um, I think we we said we were German or something. Some I think we said we were Canadian. Yeah, or it, was Cana- it was Canadian. It, was, it wasn't really. Uh, you didn't want to say you were American. Yeah, this was what? This was Bush. Bush. This was Bush. Yeah. W, Bush. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't really in vogue for us to, to uh, be American over there. Yeah. We, we had a good time. I, yeah. I really I, miss it, it. It was nice to have somebody else, at least one other American, which was insane that you went to school so close to where my hometown was. And it was yep. just like you go all the way across the world and you think you know it just reinforces that small world mentality like no matter where you go you're gonna you're gonna find somebody you know it was great it yeah. was by far like the most fun i've had with someone overseas uh we i wish we could have gotten out more we, we were kind of stuck there in harbin mm-hmm. um and it was cold and it was if you look at harbin on a map for those who have a map nearby um it's way higher than Vladivostok is, and it's north of the Siberian, uh, wherever the Siberian cutoff is. So basically you have six months of the year where it's, you're freezing, there's there's permafrost on the ground. Um, people over there were drinking to stay warm, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was a crazy place to live. It was very, very much in the Cold War vibe. Yeah, it was, it was very, 
Yeah, that that's almost like, you know, when you see those World War II movies, like sometimes yeah. like it felt like that occasionally. It was really, really strange. But all right, so you left. Yeah, you left China. Oh, wait, how much of the language did you actually get down in four years? Gosh, I I had a operational language uh, mastery. I don't know that I was grammatically correct at all. I couldn't write it at all. I couldn't, I could read basic names of cities and like hotels or hostel or whatever. Um, and I could speak pretty well. Um, I could speak enough uh, to get around, uh, enough to order at a restaurant, enough to get in a taxi and tell them to go somewhere in the city, enough to get home, uh, but no more than that. And uh, I, I think it was pretty much based on the fact that I was teaching basic English and they were speaking basic Chinese back to me and I was learning from my students and also learning from these like taxi drivers who you'd meet every day, different person every day, people on the bus, people who we'd work with. I mean, I just kind of picked it up. So did you. Um, it was yeah. crazy. Yeah, it was, it was such a cool experience. Um, I got to get back there sometime. We met some great people. We sure um, did. Food was awesome. The food yeah. was by far the, the best part. It was amazing. Um, yeah. All right. So what happened? So you came back and you finished your bachelor's and then yep. where did life take you after that? So it, when after I came back on my second stint in China, I was pretty down. I just ended a relationship um, and the recession was in full fling. Um, it was really hard to find a job with a bachelor's degree in English creative writing. Um, so I subbed, uh, substitute taught in two different uh, districts around my house. And I, you know, I earned about 60 to $70 a day doing that, um, which is basically what you might pay a babysitter. Um, but I was working eight hours, uh, babysitting a whole lot more children than you would as a babysitter. So that wasn't for me, uh, about 2013, I enrolled, uh, to get a master's degree at the university of North Texas and, uh, professional and technical communication. Um, in the tech comm department. And so that's when I really started my journey to where I am now. And I met my wife within the first half year of that. Um, and really beyond that, um, became um, a technical writer and editor. Oh, wow. So how long have uh, you and your wife been together now? We've been together six, yeah, six years and married five years. Wow. Cool, yeah. man. So uh, what was that first job as a technical writer? Like, what exactly did you do? Yeah, so coming out of my master's, I was recruited by Texas Instruments um, as a contract worker, which means basically you don't get very many benefits and you have to work a whole lot. Um, I had, um, but I, I was thankful for anything that could get me off my feet and into the workforce. Um, as I said, it'd been so many years of me struggling, uh, trying to find a good job locally and kind of settling for um, substitute teaching and then doing some catering on the side while I was a student. And then uh, I neglected to mention that when I was a master's student, I was a teaching fellow um, and I taught uh, technical communication um, in the department. So I had some teaching experience um, in technical communication but I really had the you know, degree now to fulfill the job requirements that you need. Um, so I was recruited right into TI. I interviewed, um, I interviewed well, I guess, and I got the job. The, the job was about an hour and a half from my house. Every day I'd have to get up and, and drive about an hour and a half to get to TI, uh, which is in the middle of Dallas for those of you uh, keeping score, it's in Richardson. Um, but it was worth it. It was worth it. I was just newly married. I, I was desperate, hungry, needed a job. And it was a great job. It was a wonderful experience. And I loved, uh, I loved my time at TI. So um, for everybody listening, um, can you break down what technical writing is and, and then what, you, what you actually did in TI? Well, yeah, absolutely. So technical writing is taking complex information and breaking it down for your intended audience. And that means knowing your audience before you begin writing anything. It means uh, doing an analysis of your, uh, maybe a persona that you create of who's going to be reading. Um, and you also have to back this up with principles that you've 
learn, uh, and obviously I learn in my degree. Um, but at TI, um, that kind of played out and I was uh, connected uh, and given documentation from engineers. Um, these were engineers working on all sorts of different things like embedded processors, uh, internet of things, hardware. And I would take those um, manuals and documentation and I would rewrite them and edit them and um, even edit the artwork that they would send me the schematics of the um, of whatever product it was so that it could be understood by um, someone who was not familiar with it, if that, if that makes sense. So I, I, would, I would do the rewriting and then I would send it back and there would be a back and forth between the engineer, uh, the author and myself. Um, so that, that generally was what I did. I put my headphones in every day and I, I, I just rewrote things that were not written for an audience. They were written for themselves. They were written from an expert point of view and I, I made them understandable for a non-expert usually. Hmm. Somebody who would be purchasing the product. Right. Um, so you said you did the, had to redo some of the artwork? Yeah, so we, we did have illustrators that we worked with, but we would, we would definitely have to bring them up to TI specifications, um, which were very strict. And so sometimes we could do that by ourselves, and sometimes we would use illustrators who uh, would kind of help us along with that. So can you, what are some main principles when you use to tailor um, a, a writing for, uh, you know, you know, I wouldn't say, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll go with tailoring a, a piece, a piece of uh, an article down to the target audience. So, yeah, so you start with knowing your audience. You start with writing down, you know, who's your audience? What is their level of expertise? Um, who's going to be reading this? And, and, and getting all of that down. And then you have to take all the technical concepts and you have to bring them down to a um, understandable level. And it's hard for me to kind of explain this more, more than you have to have an, uh, an understanding of writing style um, where, where you are placing emphasis on the important things in a sentence and you have to sometimes move sentences around. Um, you have to um, make sure that the subject is in the beginning of the sentence um, so that um, people aren't confused by what the sentence is about. Um, you also have to make sure that you follow an old new pattern where you have you introduce new information with information that's already familiar to an audience. Mm -hmm. um, and those are just a few of the principles that I teach right now and uh, that I employed at my jobs um, that's a, in technical communication. That's awesome. Yeah, I never, I never actually thought about how much, I guess you would say, science it is breaking right. down something like that. Um, right, and you have to do it with any sort of professional communication, and that's... Um, really has become uh, an emerging science. Um, and since I, I think the Second World War uh, is where it really took off academically. Um, and actually, um, there's a whole lot of, about it before that. Um, I think there was a Thresher manual that I had to read in my um, Principles of Technical Communication. And the Thresher manual was less about how to use the Thresher and more trying to sell you things right? Capitalism, mm -hmm. um, through the manual itself. And, and um, uh, there are also manuals for uh, that were directed specifically at women. Um, for example, um, a sewing machine back in the day, they would come with a manual that was directed towards women. And people um, back in the day um, had less of a respect for women. And it showed in their writing. Definitely, there was a, a level of you know, I have to walk you through this and, and you, you can't understand it because you're a woman. Um, there's a lot more to it and I'm, I'm just kind of giving you the rough details, but there's, there's a lot that goes into knowing your, your audience and respecting your audience um, that people need to take into consideration in professional and technical writing. Wow, so is um, the art of breaking it down but not treating your target audience as they're stupid is that seems like a very thin wire to balance Literally, yes and and breaking it down uh, so that anyone off the street could come and understand something very complex um generally um speaking that is correct huh um yeah so what 
do you teach the history of technical writing as well during during your lecture? I don't. Um, that's more, you know, I leave that to the actual professors. I'm just a lecturer. Um, I just teach the principles and how to do it um, through memos, through um, reports, through other types of uh, projects that um, I assign my students. Um, and then I can, you know, I, I want to see that they are taking the audience into um, consideration. And I want to see that they're applying the principles of technical communication that I've taught them, which um, depending on the semester, whether it's five week or 16 week, it could take a lot longer to understand than we have um, in the class. So I just want to see some evidence that students are taking it seriously and doing uh, the hard work that they should be doing to understand and to um, take complex information and basically make it understandable for everyone. Hmm. So what, information. yeah. So how was the, what was the process like, like interviewing and, and getting the current, the job you have right now? Okay. So, um, it was kind of a, not a very high, uh, stress environment to come into because I was, I was, uh, comfortable, uh, in the academic setting I had taught before and, um, I had to do a teaching demo and I had an all day um, interview on campus with uh, my current colleagues and the head of the, uh, the chair of the department. So I had to do about a 20 minute demo. I did a handout um, and they were supposed to fill out the handout as I did my presentation. I don't, I, I'm trying to remember what I did in my presentation. I was a long time ago, um, but I had the requisite experience and a degree for this job um, as lecturer and after that I just started teaching um, it just it was an all-day thing they got to know me they asked me questions asked me about my teaching style they asked me about uh, what I do in certain situations situational um, hmm. awareness um, you know what were my goals how did I just want to jump in jump out that's not I, I like to teach and I want to be a teacher for a really long time um, in this department. I really enjoy my job. I really enjoy helping people. I really enjoy seeing students, uh, that light bulb turn on, um, seeing them uh, improve their lives by learning certain skills that I can teach them and then keeping in touch with them as they get older and um, need help in the future with resumes or whatever it is. Um, I teach all sorts of documentation um, and, and skills uh, that that people come back and say thanks later on, um, and I, I've really appreciated uh, the ability to do that because people did that for me when I was going through school, and um, I just really enjoy the interaction with with kids um, of all ages on the undergraduate level. Hmm. That's awesome, man. Um, yeah. So, what would you say were some of your biggest um, struggles getting to this point along the way? I mean. Besides, besides, I guess, you know, dealing with the recession when you, when we came back. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just really difficult to work. I worked in three different fields, large fields. Uh, I worked in the finance industry. I worked in engineering, um, obviously with TI, and then I worked in um, IT for a while. And so I found the, the corporate structure somewhat, uh, you know, got in the way of good work. Um, at some uh, organizations that I've worked at in the past. I found that um, just uh, in general uh, exhaustion of, from driving. I did a lot of driving. Um, as you know, the Dallas-Fort Worth area is just very spread out. So all the jobs are spread out. So you have to get up extremely early and get in the car and you have to fight traffic and get to wherever it is. Um, that you need to go. And then you have to do the same thing at five o'clock or six o'clock whenever you leave. So that level of exhaustion at the end of the week is you know, grading on everyone. It's hard for everyone to concentrate. And really all I wanted to do was sit down and do my work um, or interact and you know, have meetings that I, that I need to have um, with my colleagues. Mm. So that, you know, just simple things like that. I, I don't think that I had a whole lot of trouble. I, I, I'm thankful for all my um, previous jobs and all my experiences that brought me to this point. So uh, the 
one thing I'm curious about is when you worked in engineering, you said that mm -hmm. you worked with an author. Was that person a, an engineer? Correct. They were the author and engineer. They, they wow. had worked to create the product and then they had also authored the documentation. So it was my job to take that documentation and then uh, create a, a reader focused uh, document. How much did you learn about technology and, and from an engineering perspective while doing that job? Uh, uh, not much, not as much as I wish I had. Uh, it's definitely a science of, you know, taking the words and make and, and changing them into a readable form. It's not mm -hmm. so much learning um, the facts of the, uh, you know, specifications of each product. Um, so I didn't actually learn a whole, I did learn a little bit, but I've forgotten it by now. Hmm. I did a lot of back and forth um, with people who had, you know, very advanced engineering degrees and uh, many times uh, they would they would email me back and say, hey, why did you change my words here? What, you know, why did you change this? Why did you change that? And I would say, well, will you please show me where I made it inaccurate? And then that would kind of end that conversation um, because they just didn't, they didn't like it because it wasn't in their voice. They didn't like it because it wasn't their original. Um, they didn't like anyone coming in and changing the way something sounded or the way something was written. Um, but they, if, if there was no, um, inaccuracy that I created through my rewrite, there was really no basis for me, uh, you know, changing anything that I did. Hmm. Is that, is that, uh, did that happen a lot uh, in terms of, or any other uh, job that you've had when you were taking somebody else's work, um, struggling with fighting against what they considered their voice? Yes. So that, that really happened on a case by case basis. And yes, it happened at every job that I worked at. Um, but it also comes down to, uh, and back to knowing your audience, they're your audience, right? For your, um, even for your revisions, for them to accept your revisions, you have to make sure that you justify them um, with uh, principles of technical communication and also just good reader focused um, uh, reasoning. So I could usually, talk someone down from an angry stance with, with some reasonable um, explanation on why I did what I did. And that taught me a lot um, about knowing my audience. Even uh, you, you have more than one audience at all times, right? It's the author and it's also the user. Um, so you have to, of course, your author is your primary uh, sometimes when you're, when you're justifying things, but your user is usually the primary audience. Did you have to make any sacrifices that you knew would be better for the user, but just to please the author? I mean, yes, I, I'm certain that I did at some point have to make sacrifices to please the author uh, so that they would make other sacrifices for me. There was always, there's always a level of, um, you know, a pleasing, a pleasing of the author that has to happen. But usually a reasonable person would um, be able to take what I had written and understand uh, with a little explanation. And then I, I just got really good at explaining things. I, I really developed my, my ability to explain and also to compromise when something was a minor change that, you know, it, it wasn't going to affect the user as much as another change that I really wanted them to accept, if that makes sense. That's cool, man. Um, yeah. So tell me about the, the, the new gig that you got um, at the university. So, yeah, I will still be teaching three classes in the fall, uh, two 2,700 uh, service level technical writing classes, and then one is uh, 2,800 profession of technical communication where I'll do an overview of uh, the different parts of the profession, um, including project management, uh, user experience and usability, and also technical writing and editing, which are, you know, generally those are the three um, ways you can go in technical communication. Um, but I am now um, going to be serving as a director of corporate relations for our department. And that just means maintaining our corporate partners, keep them happy, uh, going out and seeing what opportunities are available for our students, communicating those to our students and our faculty, 
uh, and, and a bunch of other things, including uh, overseeing internships for undergraduates and graduate students. Hmm, that's awesome. So what, what are you looking forward to most, uh, to do most in that position? Oh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that aspect of getting to know, um, I, I do have some industry contacts, but getting to know new people. I just, I'm a people person, I like people. Um, I'm looking forward to making new friends, making new contacts in the industry, um, and then really digging into those and seeing uh, what I can do for the department and then what I can do to kind of benefit both the, the corporate entity and uh, you know, our collegiate department. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds like a very uh, important job. Um, so do they have more than one um, of those positions, like for every department, or is it just... So I can't speak for other departments because I'm un unclear about the structure of those. But in our department, um, there's only one director of corporate relations. And uh, recently, uh, we, we had another... Uh, uh, the, the previous director stepped down and then I was offered the position, which I'm very thankful for. Um, and then we also have a, a director of recruiting who goes out and recruits uh, at junior colleges and in high schools and so on and so forth. Um, and also on campus because people, commonly English majors will change their, um, they'll change their major mid, uh, you know, maybe in their sophomore year or their freshman year. Uh, to technical communication because it's just more practical um, and it just makes more sense. Uh, people uh, also like to get a technical communication certificate through our department, um, and it's just a really good it's a really good way to make yourself a professional um, and to uh, get out there and get a job, which everybody wants in college. So, hmm. um, so back to teaching, what yes. are the biggest differences that uh, like compare and contrast the age groups that you've um, that you've taught that I've taught in the past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if this is so much different than any other age group, it's undergraduates is what, who I teach now. Um, usually sophomore, freshmen, seniors. Um, uh, they are they come in with an expectation and they they get a syllabus on day one. And you really don't deviate from that syllabus. You have, I usually have all of my lessons already prepared. They're already uploaded. Um, there's a lot that I, I hide from them and I kind of release as the semester goes on. Like I, you know, day by day, I release lectures and I release different things as they need them um, so that they can prepare for tests or they can prepare and do their projects or, or write their papers. Um, so that's, that's a big difference in, you know, the subbing that I did, I, I didn't really have a plan when I was a sub. Um, you know, you kind of followed the plan of the teacher who, who left that. And then when we were uh, overseas, it was more free form. I, can, I could come up with my own plans. And I, you know, usually that was week by week. This is more, I, I prepare ahead of the semester. And then I have a, a course that's kind of uh, been vetted, um, especially with courses that I've taught a bunch of times. Like I have those all ready to go. I don't need to create anything for those. And then if I find new resources that would benefit my students, I'll add those as we go along. Just kind of just in time information. Um, whatever the students would benefit from, I try to add in there. And I, I try to take good ideas that my colleagues bring to me and add those as well. Hmm. So it's a little collaboration and then also a little bit of research here. Uh, yeah, I, you know, that's one good, that's one thing that I, uh... I love teaching one overseas, whether it was um, when I was in Thailand or China, it was that free form that you could really just, whatever you thought would, would be the best yeah. way to convey that information, even if it was like improving on the spot, because you, 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 you kind of had to just read the, the moment. Did. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's really cool. So what do you have planned? Like, well, actually back up, how many years have you taught? at the university now? So it's, it's coming up on one year, but I, I did teach as a TF for about a year and a half. Okay. Um, but I wasn't full-time. I've been teaching full-time for a year. Awesome. August. Awesome. Yeah. And then, uh, so what do you, where's, where's your next step? Like, what do you want to do from here on out? Is just keep on being a, a professor or like, or maybe go for your doctorate? 
I plan to keep teaching um, at this level um, in my department. Uh, uh, I don't have any plans to make another step. Um, I don't have plans to go back into the field at this time. Um, I really like what I do. I really love my job. If, if I could say um, that this is my dream job, um, I will go ahead and just say that. Uh, this is the perfect job for me. I love the students. I love the you know, hustle and bustle of the semester. And I also enjoy the, the benefits of having a summer off um, for, you know, if, if I don't teach summer classes, um, which are sometimes offered to me, then I have that time with my family. And also, you know, winter break, I get that as well. I have great benefits, I have uh, state benefits. So it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. It may not pay as much as um, something in the industry, but also um, it is beneficial in other ways to me. Um, and I really, I, I, this is where I want to be um, for the foreseeable future. Hmm. That's, that's amazing. Not many people can get to the, the job that they love that was meant for them. You know, it took I mean, that's, some years, yeah. that's it took a, a lot. And then I, you know, I'm so thankful for the opportunity that I have to be doing what I do. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware that, it's not offered to, to many. So I, I don't take any of it for granted. Hmm. That's awesome, man. Um, all right. So let's jump into some Q and a, I only have a couple for you, but, uh, um, cool. so you, all, you mentioned, uh, that you, 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 you taught resume writing or that's right. I do every semester. How does I, that I, resumes with uh, about you know 60 students wow so depending on any tips that, that that you can give because we actually did a whole um because you know um my wife is a recruiter so we actually did a a stream talking about um what not to make your resume look like um, okay and so do you have any actually tips on constructing a resume absolutely um so first off you need to have a you need to have a cover letter and a resume that go together. Um, they need to be compatible together, and they should play off each other, right? You should create the resume first, and create the cover letter second, and base it on the resume. Um, I have a formula um, that I actually use for that that I've given from a professor, um, where you you each sentence is kind of pre-written, and you just kind of fill in the blanks for the job that you are. Uh, you are going for. Also, uh, I would recommend having a master resume, creating a, a, a resume with every experience that you have, every certification, every job, um, every degree, and then um, tailoring each resume uh, that, you, that you use for a job to the job posting itself. And that's what I teach my students. I, I make them look for a job posting, and then we uh, tailor it to the qualifications of that job um, as, uh, noted in the job posting itself. So I would recommend, you know, always maintaining you know, that long uh, master resume that has every single thing and then cutting out the things that are not on the job posting or do not directly relate to um, the job that you are going for at the time. Um, so that's a big, that's a big tip that um, I would go for. Um, also parallel lists, making sure that you have lists that all begin with an active verb. Um, and that the verb is always in the same uh, tense, usually present tense, right? Or past tense, depending on previous job or current job. Um, that's, that's, that's another thing. Make sure that all your lists are parallel and all begin with this, the right part of speech. And that should be the same part of speech throughout. Um, make sure that your typefaces are um, consistent throughout your resume. You wanna have no more than three typefaces. You want to make sure that your name is the largest thing on your resume, that you have um, good alignment. I, this is what we call the crap method. You must have contrast, um, a, a contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. And all those things need to go together. So that's contrast meaning good contrast between your headings and your and your text on the page. You need to have repetitive form, so the repetitive design that looks the same throughout, right, and also repetitive uh, grammatical structures and stylistic choices. Hmm. Also, you need to have alignment. You need to have things that are aligned on the page together. So you can't have something that's just hanging off in the corner 
of the page that doesn't align with anything else on the page. Um, and then proximity, things that are similar should go together, right? So if you're a student, your education would all be grouped together in chunks at the very top of the page. Whereas if you had a lot of expertise and uh, experience, you would feature that and have that very near to its, uh, each, each uh, section should be near to itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's great, right, man. So, um, yeah. So how many pages generally do you, do you recommend for a resume to have? No more than one. Really? Never, never, ever, ever go over one page. Um, always leave them wanting more. Always leave them uh, with questions that they want to ask you in person, right? Because what's the point of a resume? It's to get that interview, right? You want to get that interview. You want to get in the room so that you can talk about your amazing achievements um, in person. Right? You want this to kind of tantalize the recruiter or to tantalize the headhunter who's coming after you um, and say, hey, I want to know more about that person. So you, you want to say references available upon request. You never want to include references on the resume itself, um, but you want to put that in your, in your footer. And then also you, you never want to go over a page unless you're going for an academic job, which you would use a CV. And that's a completely different thing than a resume. Um, what is the but difference yeah. between a CV and a resume? CV is, is basically your master resume, uh, and that's what's expected for different academic jobs. And it will have, for, for musicians, it'll have your performances that you were in and so on and so forth, who you studied with, um, different stuff like that, that I'm not gonna get into, but um, a resume generally, and for like 99% of people is one page thing. Uh, and then you need a cover letter that, that works from the resume itself. Dude, that's awesome. Um, so someone said share the formula that you have for the. For I, I can the, send it to you. That would be this. great because we actually might do a whole stream and might have you back sometime to go over it yeah, with us as yeah, well. Be happy to come back. Um. Uh, okay. Next question is um, which is really interesting because this is one I I kind of had as well. Is do you have do you have to have a master's degree to become a lecturer? And, and like on my side, I didn't even know that, like I knew community college, you, you just needed a master's generally, but I didn't know about um, like an actual university just having a master's degree to lecture. Yeah, you do. Um, for this position, you, you, you must have a, a master's degree. Um, you can have a doctorate as well. Hmm. Um, and so I would say generally yes for uh, to teach um, if, to teach at, in a full time position in a, in a capacity such as uh, what I have you would need a master's degree and that would be something that would it, it would be a deal breaker if you didn't have that. So did you have to go up against others that had doctorates? Yeah, I mean I'm not sure who I went up against. I'm not sure who they interviewed. Um, other than myself, but yes, I would assume so. Huh, that's crazy. So, do you think that your your actually your real real world experience really contributed to you getting that position as well? I would say yes. I would say it, uh, everything comes into um, play when you are interviewing, right? It's your personality. It's it's your experience. It's also your you know, are you a good teacher? Do you like teaching? Mm -hmm. Do you like students? Do you like being in the classroom? Because there's a whole lot of people who that's not true for them, right? Um, and all of those things, like I'm, I'm excited to get up in the morning and I'm excited to get in the classroom and I'm excited to meet uh, new students and to help them along and uh, teach uh, at this level. So I think that that unique um, combination of those things kind of, I don't know, maybe put me over the edge, but um, that's that's all well, I have to say. I don't know what what it looked like on the other side of the, you know, hiring uh, t desk or whatever. Well, I can attest, man. Seeing you just teach when we were younger, how good you were then. I can imagine that you've only gotten that much better right now. So I, I would love to come sit in on on a class one day, man. Come on down. Come on. Um, I I do love teaching, and I I really do um, welcome you know, anyone to come and, and study at University of North Texas, um, the Department of Technical Communication. We have great um, faculty who will help you through um, 
you know, what is technical writing? How can it benefit me? How do I become a professional? Um, and that I think that's true of almost every university who has a technical writing program. Um, they're, you know, consummate professionals who are there because they love what they do. And that's that's true of, of our faculty. So are you guys pretty close? Um, yeah, I would say I'm friends with almost everybody. That's um, awesome. I also I, I also am a former student of every professor there because I went through the program. So mm. um, that might have something to do with me being closer to some rather than others, but I'm, I'm pretty close to everybody. That's awesome. All right, yeah. so I got a couple questions uh, back to resumes. So just one word sentences for job duties and skills. I, so you want to make sure that you are filling the page um, with as much experience as you can. And it, it should all be based on the job posting, as I said previously. Um, so I would look at each sentence of, ex of experience on your master resume and say, does this relate or can I make it relate to um, a qualification or a requirement of the job posting, right? And so you have about what, five or 10 uh, qualifications on every job posting. So you wanna basically hit the top three to five, make sure that you um, really maximize your, your sentences that, that illustrate your experience on those. Um, especially the top three, which are probably non-negotiable, whether it's, you know, you must have three to five years experience doing this or whether it's must be able to work with people or on a team or whatever it is you want to. Uh, also another, a good principle, and this is one of the, this is maybe the main principle of technical communication is to show, don't tell. Um, and that, that means to um, show experience rather than talking of telling about experience, right? Say completed, you know, five projects under a time deadline within one month, right? That, that's impressive, is it not? Hmm. Rather than I completed some projects, right? That would be <laughs> impressive information. I did right? some you stuff. Want, you want to impress them. <laughs> and you also want to use numbers to, to pop out on the page. Numbers can be a thing to draw the eye as well as white space around um, information that is more important, right? You want to, you want to draw the eye with numbers and use white space to highlight information um, that is really pertinent. So you want, I, I also, I, I think I'm getting away from the question. What was the original question? <laughs> it was just like one word sentences for job duties and skills. You want to make sure that they are, that they are succinct and concise. I think that's what this person is mm -hmm. asking. Um, but you, you can have bulleted lists of things that you've done. It does not need to be um, limited to one one word or one sentence, right? For each job, right? I might have five uh, bullet points for things that I've done, right? And each one of them begins with a verb that's present tense for what I do right now, right? Teach blah, 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 number of students um, on a weekly basis, uh, spend this amount of time preparing, whatever it is. Uh, you wanna make sure that you, you make those um, verbs very uh, exciting and that they pop out and that they're impressive, right? Use that information, use those active verbs to highlight and make, you know, where if you manage some people or if you manage some, some items, make sure that you use the verb manage, right? That's an impressive verb. Whereas worked to do this or helped to do this, those are not as impressive. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Huh, good, good advice. All right. Um, is it worth putting your life experience, i.e. travels, on your resume? Depends on if they connect to the job posting. So um, relevant. If they, you know, you want to make sure that the, that the job posting is the uh, it's the compass by which you navigate your your uh, what you include on your resume. Um, if your travels are for work, and if they are, uh, you know, highly, you know they're impressive enough, yes, right? But everything on your resume must connect to something in the job posting and don't include stuff that does not, right? And maybe if you're if you're applying for jobs where your, your experience doesn't necessarily correlate, maybe you're applying for the wrong type of job. Hmm. That kind of segues into this next question. What if you do not have those experiences on a job, but you wanna get into that field? 
So there are many ways to get experience um, that are outside of jobs, such as Linda. You can you can go and take some online courses. Mm -hmm. uh, you can start doing freelance technical communication. Um, you can start doing freelance writing. Um, there's a there's a bunch of different ways. I mean, that's just for for a technical writer. You can start doing editing on the side, right? Um, and charging for it actually. Um, you need to figure out a way to get that experience so that you can get into that dream job that you want to have, right? Um, and you have to be creative in the way that you do that. You know, nobody's going to hand you that job. Nobody's going to say, oh, well, he could probably do it. Um, but if you have experiences that you currently, um, you know, that, that might correlate, if you can phrase them correctly, then you might be able to get that job, right? So if you have something that might be adjacently um, related, then you can probably phrase it in a way that makes it seem like you could do what they want you to do, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Right. So I went from the IT industry to the financial industry, and I had to show that I could do um, the type of research and the type of uh, information development that they wanted. And I, I did that by showing similar tasks that, that would be um, available in any corporation, right? That I would, you know, meetings, teams that I worked on, projects that I worked on, documentation that I worked on, documentation samples that from my work, um, all of that stuff, all those experiences. Corporations, you know, generally have the same things that they want technical mm -hmm. writers to do. Um, so those things really do translate for, for uh, technical writers. Uh, I can't speak for other uh, jobs and other professions, but I would assume, you know, in finance, if you're a financial analyst, it would be the same almost anywhere. Um, of course, mortgage financial anal uh, analysts probably do something different than uh, people who work in, uh, you know, IT or corporate financial analyzing jobs or whatever. Um, right. But I would just say, take the experience you have, don't lie, but make it so that it seem, you know, make it so that it is relevant. You have to, you have to phrase it so that it can seem relevant, right? And you sometimes have to use the same words that are in the job posts because um, they're looking for those words. Those words are written there for a reason because that's what they're looking for. Somebody who can do these things. Don't lie. I have to say that again. Um, they will see through that and they will not hire you for the job, but you, you need to make sure that you can correlate the things that you're currently doing uh, to a future job uh, that has similar um, duties. And of course, they're not going to find a perfect candidate, but you want to at least stand out enough so that you can get in the room. You want to get in the room with the, the boss so that you can shake their hand, look them in the eye and explain you know, who you are and what you've done in the past. And that's all you can do um, as a job seeker, right? But you wanna put yourself in a good um, stead and in a good uh, place so where you can have a lot to talk about when you get in that room. Hmm. Yes, I've absolutely no, like don't embellish. No, yeah. don't embellish, but phrase it using their words, right? Use their words to explain what you are doing now. Hmm. Use the job post. The job post is your most important source of information because they have disseminated that to everyone. And so whoever can use the job post best is usually the person who gets hired. It's a great, great way to look at it. It's the conversation, you know? Absolutely. All right, man. So let's get you back to your family and your vacation. Um, I want to thank you so much again for coming on. But uh, so any any uh, books, uh, podcasts um, that you want to recommend before you head out? Yes. Um, so I have two books. Um, I don't have any podcasts. I'm not a big podcast listener. Um, but uh, The Insider's Guide to Technical Writing is a, just a good matter of fact book. It's written by Krista Van Lam. Um, and it's, it's awesome. Um, it's just an introduction to what is technical writing? How does it work? Why do we exist? Why do we need technical writers? And then um, I think that if you are considering that, if you're interested in that, that would be a book I would uh, consider a go-to. And then um, Rocket Surgery Made Easy 
is another one and it's by Steve Krug, who also, there's a bunch of YouTube videos of this guy. And this is for those who are interested in, in usability. Um, and it's a, it's a field unto itself, but also a uh, part of technical communication. Um, but it's basically how to take these principles of usability and apply them to anything at your work uh, space, right? Anything um, that any document or any um, situation that you uh, have at work, you can probably apply usability concepts to it. Um, so you can just Google Steve Krug and see everything that he's written, but I really like rocket surgery made easy. And that's so if you're interested in usability, and that means like how do websites work and how do we optimize websites and such for people, um, right? What are good design choices? And then testing those design choices, and making sure that um, they are optimal and that they are actually helping people, right? And you can apply usability across anything, um, right? So just check those two out um, and I'll keep you posted if I come up with any podcast choices or yeah. anything that I find uh, throughout the, the year. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. I'm, I'm, you got me interested now. So uh, everybody, if this interview wasn't enough and if you're interested in technical writing, it seems like the University of North Texas is where it's at. Uh, cause I, I want to go sit in on class right now, man. If I, if I can make it out that way, you know, as soon as school starts, I'd, I'd be doing it for sure. But, um, any last thing you want to say before we let you go? I was going to say it was a pleasure and, uh, look forward to seeing you sometime whenever you're in Texas and, uh, hope, hope that's sooner rather than later. Yeah. Like you uh, said, we got a whole another podcast about our China adventures we got to make, right? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We have to bleep it out, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, you have a good vacation, and thank you so much for coming on. We'll talk to you later. Have a good night. All right, you too, man. Bye. Bye. I'm getting off here. We're losing everybody. We're losing everybody with our poop talk.